thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, tendermint and how tendermint might be useful for or applied to or used by Tezos. Uh, so I work for, just for some initial clarity, I work for the tendermint slash Cosmos project, which builds several things and they can be utilized separately. In this presentation, I'm just going to talk about tendermint, which is the consensus side. You can also learn about Cosmos elsewhere uh, if you like. So mostly I'm going to go over the Tendermint consensus state machine, what rounds are utilized uh, to provide finality and to guarantee agreement and termination, uh, kind of our design considerations in building the protocol, what we wanted to achieve, how we went about doing it. Uh, I'll try to reason through a basic correctness proof. If you want more terminology, I encourage you to check out the paper on archive, but it's not that hard to understand. Part of Tendermint's design goals uh, are to be quite simple because we want it to be implementable in a blockchain context, preferably by different clients in different languages, and have it be easy for people to verify that they've done it correctly. So it shouldn't be too hard to understand. I'll also talk about incentive design, so how we need to incentivize different actors within the uh, consensus system to behave in certain ways for the best interest of the protocol. Sort of how we've done that in Cosmos, but how it also could be done differently, maybe in Tezos or just more broadly. Uh, I'll talk about how Tendermint could be used as a finality gadget. So in, uh, as we use it in the Golang implementation of Tendermint, Tendermint both produces blocks and finalizes blocks, but the two uh, actions are separable. So you could utilize an existing block production system like Tezos has, but use Tendermint still to provide finality rounds. And I'll also talk about some risks and challenges uh, or gotchas you might face if you choose to implement versions or variants of Tendermint. So, some background. Uh, Tendermint is a descendant of earlier academic work in Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, mostly of the uh, DLS uh, paper published in 1988 and PBFT published in 1999. Similar to those uh, algorithms, Tendermint has a 3F plus 1 threshold, so the classic one-third Byzantine uh, maximum, as long as the total number of nodes is higher than or equal to uh, three times the number of faulty nodes plus 1, Tendermint can guarantee uh, agreement so that no two correct nodes will ever come to a different value. And it can also guarantee with the additional uh, some additional weak uh, synchrony assumptions, termination, that the algorithm will always terminate and agree to a value. Again, assuming the less than one-third Byzantine threshold. That's stake weighted in a blockchain context. So the very differing nodes, differing bakers or validators, they all mean the same thing, uh, could have different amounts of stake. And we only need to require that less than a third of stake weighted nodes are Byzantine, where Byzantine nodes can behave in any way. Uh, PBFT and DLS and the other initial versions published in the literature were written mostly for a data center context, although they do provide Byzantine fault tolerance, but they assume that unless the primary proposer who is producing blocks fails, there's no need to switch. So they have two modes of operation. One mode is called the nor normal mode, uh, which is mostly what Tendermint is based on, but in the normal mode in PBFT and in uh, DLS, the proposer is constant. So one uh, validator, one baker in our context is always suggesting new values. And until that validator or baker fails to propose a value or fails to propose a value that is acceptable to enough of the other nodes within some time period, uh, they continue proposing. That's not desirable in a blockchain context. And it also makes the recovery process much more complex. So. Uh, PBFT and DLS have a second mode called recovery mode or view change, where when uh, the proposer current primary is faulty and the algorithm needs to switch to a second primary in order to continue to make progress, uh, basically all the other processes have to send the messages they've re received so far to the new primary. Then the new primary has to collate those messages, ensure they reach a threshold of two thirds, and send them all back to each of the nodes as proof that they should be elected the next proposer. Uh, that has really high communication complexity because 
you have to send uh, all the messages to the new primary, and the new primary has to send all of the messages back to each node. It's also more tricky to implement because you have to implement sort of the normal mode and the view change mode. And in particular, in a blockchain context, we expect this to happen often, like maybe 10% of the proposers will be offline uh, or, or worse. So if we have this recovery mode happening uh, every 10 blocks in our blockchain, it will get much, much slower. So Tendermint uh, utilizes tend the novel part Tendermint brings to the uh, protocol construction side is to use a somewhat different uh, locking mechanism than DLS or PBFT to allow uh, the proposer to switch in the normal mode. So in Tendermint, we simply have some uh, function that gives us the proposer who's going to propose a new value, a new block uh, for each round of consensus. Uh, and as long as we continue in new rounds, we continue electing new proposers. So there doesn't need to be a separate mode for switching uh, when the primary proposer is faulty to a secondary to a tertiary. Uh, we have the same bound, so the number of nodes has to be uh, at least three times the number of faulty nodes plus one, where the faulty nodes can be Byzantine. And the partial synchrony model Tendermint uses has two times, so a time difference bound delta, and then some global time, the global stabilization time. Uh, and we require that after the global sta stabilization time, if some correct process sends some message, all of the other correct processes through the gossip network will receive the message within the time the message was sent plus the time bound. So intuitively that translates to the network can behave arbitrarily for any period of time and Tendermint will uh, remain safe, but it won't come to agreement once the network enters into a period of time where there is a finite bound on how long messages can take to get to other nodes. They can still be reordered or duplicated, but there's a finite time bound. Uh, then uh, Tendermint will come to finality in that good period. Uh, we also assume, as in PBFT and DLS, that we're using public key cryptography between all of the validators, all the nodes, so no messages can be forged. Given that, uh, Tendermint guarantees three things. It guarantees agreement that no two correct processes, P and Q, will decide on different values. It guarantees termination, that all correct processes will eventually decide on a value. And it guarantees validity, uh, which is some arbitrary function called valid, which maps value or whatever kind of value we're coming to agreement on, like a block, uh, to a Boolean. Uh, so in the Tendermint consensus engine that we've written in Go, this valid predicate checks that the block includes the hash of the past block we came to finality on, checks that uh, the transactions have appropriate signatures and fees, although it doesn't run them, doesn't check the whole state transition, uh, and it can check. Uh, we also have to, we have to include some other information in the header. We include the hash of the next validator set Tendermint is committing to for like client proof. So the valid function can check anything. The basics of Tendermint uh, are round based. So the, we use the word round to mean something slightly different than it means in some of the literature. Uh, a round in Tendermint is just a uh, set period of time with a particular proposer where all the nodes are trying to come to agreement on a new value. Uh, and all of the nodes have to know this function called proposer which maps height, the consensus instance, or the height of block we're coming to consensus on, and the round number to a proposer. So this could be pseudo-random. Uh, it could be, in, in Tendermint, it's deterministic. So we just basically cycle through all the proposers uh, relatively quickly. Uh, we also assume we have a one-way function, hash function, which takes a value and maps it uh, to an identifier where there are no collisions. Uh, we have three timeouts, timeout propose, timeout pre-vote, and timeout pre-commit for the three mo uh, phases of each round. Uh, and in order to guarantee termination, we have to increase these timeouts each round. So assuming we have, we only assume that there is some global stabilization time and some delta. And these could be, the delta could be arbitrarily long. So ev to eventually ensure that given that we have some time and some delta, we get to a good period where we have enough time for the notes to send messages to each other to agree, we increase the timeouts each round. 
just by multiplying the round number times timeout delta, where that's a parameter configurable by the nodes. Then when we've come to consensus on each round, we reset all the timeouts uh, for the new height. You could change variants of that without breaking any of the consensus assumptions. So if you have more information based on the past consensus instance for height 10, for how long it took to come to consensus, it seems reasonable that you would set new timeouts based on that information uh, to try to adapt to your network conditions. That doesn't uh, break any of the agreement guarantees that Tendermint provides. And if there is some correlation uh, between height to height on how long it takes messages to get to other nodes, it might be intelligent. But at the moment, we don't do that yet. Then there are three message types that uh, nodes can send to each other. So in Tendermint, all messages are gossiped, uh, just like mempool gossip in Tezos uh, or, or block gossip in Bitcoin. So the validator signs a message, and then the validator can relay that message through any number of uh, other nodes to the other validator who authenticates the message against the known public key. Uh, the three types of message are proposals, where the proposer for each round can suggest a new decision value, a new block. Pre-votes, where all of the uh, stakers, all the validators, can vote for a possible value ID once they've seen a proposal. And pre-commits, where all of the stakers can vote for a possible decision value ID. And I will get into what that means in a few slides. So I'm going to try to run through the state machine. Uh, please feel free to stop me and ask questions. I think Tendermint is easy enough to understand. This can be done in a presentation. Um, so for each, for some process, call it P, for each consensus instance, so each new height, we initialize uh, the state as following. Uh, set height equal to 0 or the new height. Set round equal to 0. Uh, have some step, which is initially nil. Uh, we have some decision values. And we have these four variables called locked value, locked round, valid value, and valid round. So uh, locked value and locked round are respectively the value a particular process has uh, decided as, is, is locked on. And once a process is locked on, it won't commit to any other value. And locked round is the round at which a process last locked a value. Valid value and valid round are the last possible decision values and the round in which the last possible decision value was seen. To start a round for some round number r, so r will start at 0 for each consensus instance, and then it will increment monotonically. Uh, we store the value of r in round. We start off at the proposed step. If our node is the proposer for this round, so if the pro function proposer called on height and round returns our node's uh, public key or address, then we either propose the valid value variable, or we propose uh, some function called get value. So only if we haven't yet seen any possible decision values do we get a new value. This is essential to how Tendermint terminates. Uh, so we can't just, uh, get value is basically the function that computes in a, the blockchain context, assembles transactions into a block, uh, computes the state root and computes the header, and returns that uh, to the consensus instance. But if there already has been a potential decision value that we know about, we have to propose that instead. Then, uh, assuming we're the proposer, we broadcast that proposal to all the other nodes relayed through the gossip network. If we're not the proposer, uh, we just schedule a timeout, uh, and then we move on. So uh, if we're another node, or the proposer, who hears this proposal message, assuming that the proposal message was received from the node who we know to be the proposer for this round. If it wasn't, we just ignore it. Uh, while we're in the proposed step, then we check our predicate function valid, check the predicate function on the value, which is in the proposal. Uh, and we check whether either our node has not locked a value or the value it has locked is equal to the value proposed. So we never will uh, pre-vote for, in this case, pre-vote for a value that we haven't locked. This is essential to agreement. Then we broadcast that pre-vote. Uh, now we just need to include the hash of the value because all the other nodes got the proposal message, so they'll have the value. We just need to refer to what it is we're voting for. Broadcast that pre-vote associated with this particular height and round. If either the function valid returns false, so we don't consider this value uh, one that we would accept, uh, or it does not match one we've already locked, then we pre-vote nil, which is saying that like we 
have seen a proposal, but we don't accept the value proposed. Then we move on our node to the next step. So the alternative case here is if we are, uh, is the sort of unlock case, and we only consider uh, switching to a new lock value uh, when we have seen proof that uh, two thirds plus one, uh, two, sorry, two f plus one of the other nodes have pre-voted for that value. So if our node has, uh, if we see a proposal, uh, this condition isn't satisfied, but we do see uh, two f plus one other pre-votes for that proposal, and the uh, proposal, the locked round specified in the proposal is uh, greater than or equal to the last locked round R node is stored, then we pre-vote for the uh, ID function on that value. So then we unlock our previous value basically and vote for a new possible decision value because we've seen proof in the 2F plus 1 pre-votes. If, uh, if the function valid does not return true on that value, we pre-vote no as the same as the previous case. Then, uh, once we are in the pre-vote step, uh, we schedule a timeout. So if we, timeouts are just used to ensure that if we're in some step and we don't get enough messages to proceed to the next step, we always uh, timeout and move on. Then we increase the bounds on the timeouts each round so that we'll, if we assume, again, this global stabilization time and some delta, uh, there will be some round at which the timeouts are long enough that all the nodes will have time to receive all the messages and proceed through the consensus uh, instance and finalize the value. Then, so if we see a proposal uh, and we see two F plus one pre-votes for that proposal, uh, assuming that the value is valid and that we're uh, at or after the pre-vote step, so we're in the pre-vote step or the pre-commit step, uh, once means the first time this condition is satisfied in this consensus instance. <coughs> If the step is pre-vote, then we lock this value and we broadcast a pre-commit. So uh, correctness of tendermint requires that each node pre-commit in one round only one value, and that value we consider locked. Uh, if the step is pre-commit uh, or, or the step is pre-vote, then we store valid value in valid round because we've seen this new possible decision value, which we know by the 2f plus 1 pre-votes. Uh, if we also, if we see two F plus one pre-votes for nil, then we just move quickly on to the next step, uh, which will, where we'll also need to pre-commit nil because there was no possible decision value, and then we'll move on to the next consensus instance. Does this make sense so far? Cool. Uh, in the pre-commit step, uh, we schedule a timeout, same as before, and if we see a proposal with two F plus one pre-commits, when we have not yet made a decision, uh, assuming the proposal is valid, then we can safely commit to the value. So then our consensus instance terminates. We've seen 2f plus 1 pre-commits uh, for a particular uh, ID function on a value, so a particular value, and we move on to the next round of consensus by incrementing the height and resetting the other state variables. So the timeouts uh, just works. And the first is like a shortcut rule. So if we see uh, a bunch of new votes for a later round, then we know we can't come to the consensus in the current round or note is behind and we should just start the new round. Uh, then on pr the proposed step, the pre-vote step and the pre-commit step, uh, if we reach the timeout, then we pre-vote nil. Uh, if we reach the pre-commit timeout, we pre-commit nil. And if we reach the uh, final timeout on receiving pre-commits, then we move on to the next consensus round. So, uh, brief, go ahead. Uh, I don't understand why you send the, the what, what are the meaning of the new messages that you broadcast? Basically, you, you're not saying to, your, to all the others, uh, I haven't found any value, but there are no information about the value that you're talking about. Uh, it's true that there's no information about the value. Uh, the usage of those messages is to enable consensus to move faster. You could also just not send the messages, then the nodes would time out. But if uh, your node hasn't received uh, a proposal for a value it considers valid, and it sends a pre-vote nil or a pre-commit nil, 
and enough nodes send a pre-vote nil or a pre-commit nil, then uh, before the timeout happens, uh, nodes who've heard about these pre-votes or pre-commits nil can move on to the next step. So it does require some weak altruism assumptions. Maybe if you're super, super rational and your node is not going to send any messages other than you absolutely have to, uh, there's no point in pre-voting nil or pre-committing nil. And there is an upper bound on the, uh, um, I mean, because you implement the timeout in a certain step. Is there a, an upper bound? I mean, uh, or you can increment this timeout forever? You can in increment the timeout forever. Uh, you could choose, so we just increment the timeouts linearly each round. Uh, you could choose a different way of doing that uh, depending on what weak synchrony assumptions you want to make. So if your weak synchrony assumptions are just the global stabilization time some delta, which you don't know, then, if, then you have to increase it each round, although it doesn't have to be linear. Uh, if instead your weak synchrony assumptions are some delta that is smaller than some value, but some unknown global stabilization time, increasing the time loss doesn't matter that much, and you should just keep running rounds until you get to a stable enough network. It depends on what, what you want your model to encapsulate. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the after one is what kind of model tender um, assume, but um, I guess you already answered that. <laughs> Cool. Uh, so a brief sketch of correctness. Uh, the essence is as following, that some correct process will decide upon some value b if and only if it has received two f plus one pre-commits for b. So of those two f plus one pre-commits, f is the number of faulty processes. So f of those processes may not be locked. Uh, but all of the other f plus 1 processes must be locked because by our less than a third Byzantine bound, they're behaving correctly, which means they're obeying the rules of the protocol, which means in order to pre-commit, they must have locked the value. So uh, we call that a, a, a possible decision value. Uh, a correct process will only lock with the proposal and 2 plus 1 pre-vote, so those f plus 1 correct processes uh, must have seen a proposal that they consider valid, and must have seen two f plus one pre-votes. We describe uh, that as a possible decision value, so that's stored in valid value. Valid round is used by a node to store the round that's last updated the valid value. Um, so there's sort of two cases where a correct process will accept a proposal for some value in pre-vote. Uh, in the case when it's not locked, uh, or it's already locked fee, uh, which was the first, first case here, either if uh, locked round is equal to negative 1 or locked value is v. And then the second case is if there's some more recent possible decision value with 2f plus 1 pre-votes. So even if I've already locked a value at an older round, if I see a uh, new possible decision value with 2f plus 1 pre-votes, it is safe to uh, pre-vote that. So if some correct process P decides a value V, then F plus 1 correct processes must have locked, F faulty processes might not have locked. Uh, then if F plus 1 processes must have locked, there are only 2F processes remaining since the total number of processes is 3F plus 1. And that means that no 2F plus 1 processes, since we only have 2F, could pre-vote uh, a different value. They could pre-vote the same value, that would be fine, but they couldn't pre-vote a different value. So there is no subsequent valid value v prime, which is not equal to v. And since uh, a decision value must also be a valid value, that means that no other process q can decide upon a v prime, which is not equal to v. So it could come to the same value in a different round, right? Some, some process could decide upon v in round 10, but the other process doesn't hear about the pre-commits, but it decides upon v in round 12, but there's no case when it could decide upon some v prime, which is not equal to v. Uh, termination is just guaranteed by weak synchrony, so eventually there will be some round uh, where a correct process P locks on a value because it got all the messages in time, then valid value and valid round will be updated, and eventually some proposer will propose that valid value, maybe in the same round, maybe in a later round, and all the other processes will receive the pre-commits in time, and they will uh, decide. Does that make sense? Consensus? 
uh, so incentive design. Uh, we, I guess, try to conceptualize this based on what is in the protocol's best interest, so to uh, maximize the chance of safety. And we have a few other desiderata. Uh, we want it to be the case that light like clients can receive really efficient tendermint proofs so that they can uh, verify headers easily. And uh, sometimes they can even skip headers, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we also want the consensus instances to continue, so voting power should be online, and especially it should be punished if it uh, double signs, because that put things, puts things at serious risk. So uh, this is very similar between Tendermint and Tezos, although we sort of explicitly slash for downtime instead of just not giving rewards, but it's the same uh, basic incentive. And then we slash a lot for double signing uh, to different uh, hashes at the same height. Uh, we also want it to be the case, which is not required by the consensus algorithm, but we want it to be the case that proposers will include uh, in the next block, so the valid function in Tendermint has to include pre-commits from previous block, and they will include in the next block far more than two-thirds. So to ensure that uh, light clients have to do the minimum amount of header updates, we want proposers to wait around a little bit, even once they've received uh, two-thirds plus one pre-commits, wait around a little bit for more pre-commits from other validators, which in the usual case they will get, and include those in the next block. Uh, that requires an explicit incentive, especially because there's a speed trade-off. So if I'm the proposer of height 10, uh, and I, um, just, I just saw two-thirds plus one pre-commits for height 9, I now have the information I need to make a valid proposal for height 10, uh, but for the protocol's best interest, I should wait to include pre-commits, which will require that I take a little extra time before proposing. So we explicitly reward proposers uh, for including more pre-commits from the previous block in proportion to the number of pre-commits they include. So the proposal reward changes. Um, doing that, though, introduces another concern, which is that other uh, validators who are not maybe at high risk of getting slashed for downtime could withhold their pre-commits. So if they want to decrease the proposer's reward, because it's not reward they're getting, so it's inflation, uh, they could not send the pre-commits, uh, especially if they think two-thirds plus one other people will send pre-commits. They're not trying to put consensus at risk. They're just trying to decrease the proposer reward. Uh, so we have to incentivize them a little bit for including their pre-commit as well. The other tenement is super... the entity in the network, or it's on a kind of a bound that you put around? Hmm. So slashes on the global stake. Um, one other property tendermint tries to provide is to make it as expensive as possible to finalize two different blocks at the same height. So uh, whether or not that's meaningful, because at that point, if two-thirds of stake signed two different blocks, they could also censor evidence is unclear, but we want to really penalize people for double signing. So uh, you, the 67% the uh, requirement in Tendermint is total stake. So all of the bonded stake is voting on each consensus height, and uh, all potentially all of that stake is up for slashing uh, if it misbehaves. We don't, at the mo we'll change those parameters based on how likely we think it is that people actually are trying to misbehave versus how likely it is that there's some bug in our signing implementation that causes people to double sign. So initially, it's not like all of the stake will be deleted if you double sign, but maybe 20-30% if you're a validator with 1% stake, 20-30% of your stake would be. It's much less punishing for downtime, like some fractions of a percent or even just getting kicked out of the bonded set for a while. Not all the slashing penalties need to be like, directly uh, taking away rewards or stake, they could just be uh, preventing the validator from voting and from receiving those ro rewards from voting for some future period. And Sorry. when you slash, you just burn? Or do you uh, the people that... Uh, so in Tendermint, when we slash, we just burn. Uh, at the moment, we would like to also include some incentives for people to capture evidence more explicitly than altruism. So we would probably include 
some return to the person who submitted it. Um, although you need to prevent front running, so it's a little bit complex. We also have, uh, in the particular Cosmos implementation, there's like a community pool which could get some of the slashing rewards. So, so a public good fund, as it were, uh, which you could still punish the validators, but send money to instead of burning it. But at the moment, we just burn it. Uh, sorry, what, uh, I don't know if you're going to say more later, but uh, can you say more? What's the effect of the double sign? Uh, yeah, so uh, in particular for Tendermint, we want the ability to treat finalized blocks as really, really final. Like, people should be able to send off chain transactions when they see a finalized block. Other blockchains, which are receiving light client proofs uh, over, over the interchain protocol, which Cosmos uh, also builds, basically they're verifying these headers from the first blockchain's consensus instance, and they want to be able to execute state transitions on their chain based on whatever state transitions were just finalized on the other chain. So if it is the case that uh, finality isn't really final, and two finalized blocks get submitted to the other chain, uh, pretty bad things could happen. Uh, what specifically could happen is a little bit more situationally dependent. So uh, if you are a light client and you see two different finalized blocks at the same height, you immediately know to stop. So that's less of an issue. But if uh, you didn't hear about the other block, you might not. So if you're running a, I don't know, phone in Antarctica, and you're trying to receive proof of the payment from the UN to your bank accounts, you can continue doing your Antarctic research, uh, and someone submitted a fraudulent uh, finalized block, but you never hear about the other one. Uh, th you can't ever differentiate that. What I mean, uh, so I thought, so double signing here in any of the, the participants in the, in the, in the, in the so the proposer or one of the guys that are going to check? So in order to, in order to fool a light client uh, greater than, uh, equal to or greater than a third stake must be Byzantine. So Byzantine means that they would sign, in this case means that they would sign two different things at the same height. Mm -hmm. So uh, in practice, even if exactly one third were Byzantine, it would be very, very hard for them to do this because they would have to partition the network such that the rest of the honest nodes would agree on two exactly different things and then they would sign both of them and send one of them yeah, uh, to the light client they're trying to fool. Yeah. Uh, but even if uh, far, far less than one third or Byzantine, we punish anybody who double signs to try and incentivize people to really secure their setups against double signing. So it's very, very hard in practice yeah, sure. for someone to break in and steal their node keys and convince them to do this. Uh, the other thing we're concerned about in Tendermint is that proposers will get DOSed. So the proposer election algorithm is deterministic, and although it's a little bit, uh, it can it changes near to when the proposer is elected. So it's unlike you can't predict the proposer a day in advance with a particular proposer election algorithm Tendermint uses, but you can easily predict it five minutes in advance. And uh, we're somewhat concerned that if we gave all the block reward to the proposer of each block which is sort of what's done in Bitcoin or Ethereum or most blockchains. It would make the proposer a huge DOS target that other nodes would try to uh, delay message, uh, DOS or just like message delay, would try to delay messages, especially if they were the second in line proposer in the next round so they could get the block reward. So because of that uh, and the incentives of the blockchain we're building on top of Tendermint, because this is all in the state machine, not in the consensus, but in the incentives in the state machine, we end up distributing most of the reward just stake proportionally. So we figure out who has what stake, validators and delegators, and send them uh, like 80, 80 to 90% of the transaction fees and inflation from each block. Bonded stakes are not just, not just owning the token, but having the token uh, staked in consensus for somebody. They just don't have to have it staked for the proposer. So uh, we use Tendermint as both a block production system and a finality gadget. So as you saw, the proposal message just includes a new value, which is a new block for a new height, and then uh, what that value is gossiped in the uh, same gossip as the rest of the consensus messages once other nodes receive it and finalize it, they can then apply the transactions in that block to their state, and that's how Tendermint works uh, as we've implemented it. But it would also be easy enough to use Tendermint as a finality gadget, so where you have a separate uh, 
block production rule, which can be arbitrary. So it literally could be like, there's one node which can produce blocks, and then the BFT consensus is just used to finalize blocks. We don't ever let anyone else produce them. Uh, but you could also use basically an existing blockchain run Tendermint as a finality gadget on top of an existing blockchain with some sort of uh, stake proportional proposer election like Tezos. Uh, and even existing reward mechanisms just use Tendermint for finality. Uh, this has the advantage of probably being easier to implement uh, and allowing you to maintain more of the rules in your existing block production algorithm. It also has the advantage of not tying the speed of block production to the speed of BFT finality. So tenement rounds are quick. If you have, at the moment, or in our implementation, a few hundred validators distributed equidistantly around the world, uh, it takes like six seconds to finalize a block. Uh, but if you want to run with more validators or if you want to uh, produce blocks even faster than that, assuming you can gossip them, you could produce n blocks and then just finalize every n because each block commits to the uh, linked hash list of all the previous blocks. Uh, so in Tendermint, our implementation, we run this BFT consensus algorithm with all of the stake each round. So all of the bonded validators have to sign and two thirds plus one of stake has to commit to a value. Uh, you could also run the consensus algorithm with some subset of stake uh, that introduces some concerns. One concern is that you can't trivially have a backup subset of stake uh, and finality because two different subsets of stake that are like network partition could finalize different blocks. Uh, another concern we have is opportunistic bribery. So this applies even if you have a randomized subset election. So if you elect some subset of stake to finalize a block, and you treat what that, you don't have a backup subset, but you treat what that subset finalizes as final. Uh, it could be the case that someone could write a smart contract or could write uh, some legal contract to simply bribe that subset of stake that they know will be elected for uh, double signing. And because it's a subset is much cheaper. So in order to bribe uh, a third of tenement stake to double sign, you have to pay what they would lose in getting slashed, uh, roughly speaking. Or you have to pay what they would lose in getting forked out of the network if that's the likely consequence. Whereas if only 1% of stake is finalizing each block, you have to pay much, much less. And if you rely upon finality for executing things on other chains or executing uh, off-chain value settlement, and someone who's trying to bribe might know about what you're going to do conditionally as a result of finalizing a particular block, uh, then that could be a possible attack. You could also do, you could do even fancier things with Tendermint as a finality gadget. Uh, there's nothing that limits you to running only one uh, parametrized like, instance of BFT consensus. You could run uh, fast instances with subsets of stake, like with 50 voting nodes, a few hundred voting nodes. Uh, and maybe depending on how you do it, those provide some kind of finality if they provide less finality, but still uh, more guarantees than just the block production rule. Uh, and then you could also run a slower BFT consensus round, but with actually two thirds plus one of all the stake. That maybe finishes every 10 minutes, but if someone wants to send a high value transaction on the network uh, and really wants that guarantee, they can wait. Uh, some risks and challenges. So. Some people are, are very concerned, and I think with good reason, about uh, pure voting-based proof-of-stake algorithms because they are vulnerable to coordinated validator cabals, so groups of stakers with enough voting power working together to cause some malicious action. Uh, cabals of a third can halt the chain, so they can refuse to sign any blocks. Uh, they can arbitrarily censor anything, so whatever their, their function valid on values can uh, censor out transactions or censor out evidence of Byzantine behavior uh, or censor out, I don't know, the number three, uh, and continue to make progress with values that satisfy whatever their model pride predicate is, but censor any they don't like. Um, usually that's not so much a the proposer can censor, but uh, as long as a new proposer gets elected in the next round, you would have to convince a third of proposers to censor in the same way in order to pre prevent transactions from getting included. Uh, Two-thirds stake cabals 
can sign arbitrary headers so they can say something is finalized uh, when I guess it's not or it's not clear what if they have two-thirds of the stake they are the consensus algorithm so basically whatever they do is treated as correct uh, they could also censor there's some reason to believe that uh, two-thirds stake cabals even with maybe not too much coordination would behave oligarchically and they would censor the entrance of new stakers into the consensus so uh, the way Tendermint works as we've implemented it has uh, and, and Tezos works has a dynamic uh, validator set so people can uh, you know, transfer the tokens to each other and bond under different signing keys or they can elect to leave consensus or join consensus or even the state machine could mint tokens and allow new people to enter consensus. Uh, but if uh, a lot of the stake, uh, the existing stakers want to censor that kind of transaction to keep themselves in power, they could do so. That is maybe of particular concern because it doesn't really require coordination. If they're, maybe if they're just behaving rationally individually uh, and they're not too concerned about the long-term Im impact on the network or not concerned that their delegators will kick them out of uh, voting, then they might just decide to block transactions which allow new people to bond stake and enter into the consensus. Uh, the sort of defense against these, some of which also applied to proof of stake more broadly, uh, we think is primarily fork threat. So all of these actions are attributable uh, if to, to varying degrees, but certainly if you sign arbit arbitrary headers, that's attributable even in protocol. Uh, if you censor new stakers or if a third cabal censors evidence, it is easy to see in practice that that's going on and some sort of governance function on the network can identify it and either punish the stakers or, or uh, some, if, if you can't make progress, because they're uh, censoring all new blocks, then the governance function can't work directly, but you can come to consensus off-chain and launch a new uh, forked chain with uh, an irregular state modification to remove those stakers from consensus and probably burn their tokens. So we think the implied fork threat uh, provides some measure of security. It's sort of hard to predict how much security until we see it done in practice. Uh, another challenge with this consensus algorithm is that it uh, has some maximum node cap, so you, all the nodes need to send messages to each other through gossip, but still requires uh, O of n squared message transits per round because some node sends a pre-vote and a pre-commit. All the other nodes uh, need to hear or need to hear about two thirds plus one of the nodes which sends pre-votes and pre-commits. Uh, that would be made or will be made better in Tendermint two, uh, which has no ETA, but can be made better with aggregative signatures. So where if two nodes sign a vote in consensus and they voted for the same thing, uh, then someone who sees both of those votes over the gossip protocol can add the signatures together and produce another valid signature uh, signed by like the additive pub public key, then other nodes can verify it. So that cuts the message latency uh, overhead substantially. All right. That's it. Questions? <laughs>